Hi guys, this is Angela from the App Brewery and I'm so excited to be doing this um, first ever live AMA. So for those of you guys who've been with me for the longest, you know that back in the days in the courses, we used to do these live Ask Angela Anythings. And this is um, trying to bring it back and um, see how you guys are all doing while you're um, safely at home. And yeah, so I've never really done anything like this. So um, I'm a little bit nervous, but um, hopefully it's going to go great. And um, I'm going to get to know some more of you guys. All right. So the plan is we're going to take a look at some of the questions that were asked um, ahead of time. So over the last week, you guys have been posting your questions on the Ask page. Um, and our team has compiled a bunch of the most upvoted um, questions. So we're going to tackle some of those. And then we're going to tackle some of these um, YouTube questions live. And I don't see too much of a delay in the chat. So hopefully I'll be able to get to you and um, we can do a little bit of back and forth. So, all right. So here we've got um, the question from Melissa Santos. So I'm just going to answer it all over again because it seemed like when I went to the slides, you couldn't hear me anymore. So let's try this again. Um, so her question is, how do you manage to use different languages for different pro projects without mixing up the syntax? All right, so the first thing I want to say is that I mix up the syntax all the time, um, especially when I'm working on like a Swift project for a long time, and then I switch to maybe doing a web development project um, with JavaScript, then you know I'm going to be missing semicolons, I'm going to be just not writing JavaScript code. But the great thing is that there's good linters. And if you use a good code editor like Atom or VS Code or Sublime, then they should be able to pick up these things for you. So I kind of let the machine do the machine part. And then I do the brain part, which is the logic. That's the hardest part. And the first part of her question, she actually asked, um, so is, um, is it a good idea to become fluent in one language bec before moving on to other languages? Now, I think this really depends on what you're trying to do, right? If you're trying to build, if your end project is an iOS app, then yeah, you definitely, definitely need to um, uh, get really good at probably Swift um, first. But you know, if you're trying to do something that occasionally requires just a little bit of web development skills or just a little bit of maybe like um, a Flutter um, uh, multi um, iOS and Android um, app, then you could just dive into the thing that you need. The way I always see it is, you know, these programming languages, they're not like a subject. They're not like history or geography. They're more like, um, a tool, like you're learning how to use the hammer or you're learning how to use a saw. You don't have to get to like a hundred percent of, you know, hammer ability before you can move on to the next tool. It all depends on what you're trying to build, right? All right. So let's move on to the next question. All right. So in this question, we've got from JPD. And he's asking, given that coronavirus has affected so many people and a lot of people are looking for ways of um, working um, from home, working remotely online, does that mean that all the jobs are going to be filled up um, pretty quickly and, you know, um, it'll be far more competitive? And I think I would say that, you know, you have to remember that when anything is desirable, it is going to be competitive. So if you think it's a great idea to work from home and, you know, um, have the flexibility of where you live, be able to work remotely, then somebody else is going to have that idea as well. But 
then again, you know, things that are worth doing are probably worth um, competing for. It all depends on what is your ultimate goal. And if your goal is to get a job as a web developer or as an app developer, then you just got to focus on that goal and don't worry so much about what, how much competition there is or how many other people are applying to the same thing. I mean, I remember back in the days when, so I don't know if you guys know this, but I trained as a medical doctor and I worked um, as a doctor training in um, orthopedic surgery for a number of years. And when I was in medical school, even from like day one, um, people were telling me that if you want to become a surgeon, um, like the chances are something like one in like 1000. It's just so competitive. And then within surgery, there's, you know, different competition ratios. Like if you want to do brain surgery, that's like the most competitive field because there's only so few brain surgeons. But if you want to do, I don't know, maybe another type of surgery, maybe it's less competitive. So I think even from that point, I was trained up on this idea that competition is just the way of life. You know, you want something, other people want something, and then you just got to focus on yourself. There's a really great book by um, Carl Newport, um, which I really like, called so good they can't ignore you. I think that's the title anyways. And I mean, the thing is, you don't really have to read the book. I mean, it's a good book, but basically most of it is in the title. Like become so good at whatever it is you do that they can't ignore you. And they could be your boss. They could be a recruiter. They could be, you know, anybody really. And this is really something that I've always kept um, in my mind. Like I've just tried to um, focus on doing the best job I can. And that means focusing on the student experience. Like how can I make a course that is going to be the most helpful, the most enjoyable and um the most completed, right? So I focus on these things and I don't really think about what other people are doing. Um, and that means that I have a product that I created and it's just much easier for me to think this way. If I spent all my time thinking about, well, you know, so-and-so is doing this or that person is doing that, then I'm just gonna be copying everybody all the time. And if you guys have taken my courses, you know that's usually not the way to go. Um, I mean, that also means that there's a lot of bad jokes in there that are untested and nobody sanctioned, and it's probably not a good idea. But, um, you know, hey, we gotta try things, right? All right, let's move on to the next question. All right, so this question is from Mayank Sayani. I hope I pronounced that okay. I, I think I'm just gonna be murdering people's names because I'm gonna be bad at pronunciating. Um, okay, so Mayank says a number of things. Um, my question is, how can I get a job as a full stack web developer to my dream company? What do I have to master to do so? Okay, so your goal is to get a job as full stack web developer. Now, some of you guys watching, maybe your goal is to get a job as an iOS developer. Maybe you wanna work as a data scientist. Maybe you wanna work at Facebook, Apple, Google, whatever it may be. But the great thing is you already got your goal. Like this is the first step because there are so many people I talk to who don't even know what they want. So you're already one step ahead of other people. So now that you know what you want to get, how do you get there? Well, let's think about it from the other point of view. Um, let's say that you're a company, um, let's say you're a manager at Google and you want to hire a web developer. Well, if you were the one who was doing the interview, who was sifting through all of the applications, what would you think about? This is a really, really useful exercise. And this is something that I really, it took 
it took some, you know, growing up to actually understand this. Because when you think about it from the other person's perspective, you know, they're not trying to make it hard for you. They're not trying to make you jump through hoops for the sake of jumping through hoops. But let's say that you get, um, you know, like 20,000 applications. So recently we were looking for a summer intern and there's just loads, loads of applications that come in. Um, and, you know, as much as you really want to give each application um, all of your attention and just, you know, really understand each person, you don't really have the time. So you're going to have to think about ways of making it uh, a bit easier on yourself, right? So one of those ways is by looking at somebody's qualification. But another way, and probably something that I'm more fond of, is actually just looking at what are they capable of doing. And this really is a key. So you need to build a portfolio. You need to show the world, not tell the world, what you can do. So create um, some web apps if you want to become a web developer. Create some iOS apps if you want to become an iOS developer. And don't just don't just stick to, you know, the, the stuff that you see in tutorials. You have to somehow stand out. And one of the best um, tips I can give you is, again, think from the recruiter's point of view. They want to hire a web developer. They are probably a manager, right, of some sort. Um, what are the kind of tools that they use every day? So... If you're a manager, especially if you're a product manager or a software lead, you're probably going to use some form of task management like Trello or Asana. You're probably going to use um, GitHub or something like GitHub, like Bitbucket. Think about the tools they use and build a tool that they can understand. So... If they use Trello or Asana, I'm sure there's pain points. I'm sure there are certain features that would be really cool. So if you build um, a Trello clone, but you add in some features of your own, some something that you think of that you think would be really useful, and then you show that manager what you've built, they will instantly understand what you've built they will see the advantages of your product and they will be able to attest to your skill, which is what is so, so important. So my advice, whenever you wanna achieve any sort of goal that involves other people is to think from the other person's point of view. All right, so we've done a couple of um, questions from the uh, ask page now. Um, and I'm seeing so much chat activity. I really want to get to know you guys a little bit better. So I want to do a poll. So it's going to be poll time. All right. So if you go ahead and take a look at my slide, um, I want to know where you are. So where are you streaming from? Now, what you need to do is to head over to this link. So wait a minute, I'm going to remove this banner. And you can see if you go to londonatbury.com forward slash where, it will redirect you to this horribly long um, URL um, that's underneath, which is a poll. So choose an answer. And I want to know what your uh, location is. All right, so I think some of you guys have voted. Let's see the results. Okay, I think there's like 200 votes now. I'm gonna take a look at the results. All right, so it seems like most people are from Asia. Next is Europe and next is North America. I mean, that kind of makes sense to me. I think it's about evening time in Asia now, and then 
in Europe where I'm at, in London, we're kind of during the day and then North America is just waking up. So that's pretty cool. All right. So let's take some questions from YouTube. You guys have been chatting away in there and um, I'm trying to uh, look at it for um, just to see what's actually happening if you're getting the audio and everything. But let's take some questions from YouTube. So go ahead and ask away. All right, so we got one here from Claudia and it's gonna cut off because it's quite long, but I'll read it out to you. I wanna ask you about the way you learn new coding skills. How do you go about teaching yourself new skills? What's your learning process? Okay, cool. So I think one of the most useful skills like that I've ever picked up is learning. I think if you can learn quite quickly, then it's gonna help you in pretty much all sorts of ways. So one of the ways that I do, um, one of the ways that I, I sort of conceptualize it is I try to take the entire topic and I break it down into, you know, what are all the parts I need to learn? Because when you take a textbook or when you take, I don't know, let's say, I mean, for example, at the moment I'm trying to learn German, right? If I just took a dictionary, it would take me years, years before I will learn it. And I see sometimes people learning programming a bit like that. Like they try to learn every single method, every single function in a particular programming languages, API, or, you know, just, just trying to learn it all, right? And there's a lot of courses that are also kind of like a, a reference guide kind of style where they show you everything. And I think in terms of learning, it doesn't really work. Instead, what you kind of need to do is, again, you have to have a goal, right? So if you're learning to program, maybe that goal is you have a particular app you wanna build. Now, there's certain foundational skills that you need, but once you get past the foundation, then you're kind of doing like learning Lego. You're trying to figure out, okay, I need to learn this bit. Where should I go for that? I need to learn that part in order to do this. So for example, the way that I'm thinking about German, like learning German, I've realized I don't need to write German. I probably could read, but it doesn't really bother me. All I want to focus on is actually listening and speaking. So that already makes my task a lot easier. Now, next, if I want to be able to um, speak well, then I have to practice, right? So um, there's a really good course actually by Pimsleur that I use, where all they do is they just teach you a couple of ways of saying a sentence and then they get you to practice. You just, you know, they'll be like, what is, how do you say, I wanna go to the restaurant? How do you say, I'm going to the restaurant? How do you say, I went to the restaurant, etc." And you have a lot of practice just putting the words together in some sort of logical way. And then because it's not really interactive, it's just, you know, a list of sentences I have to say, then I will take that and take Google Translate, which can listen live to what you're speaking in German and I'll translate it to English text. So then I can judge based on that translation, well, how good is my German? Did I manage to conjugate my verbs correctly? Did I manage to put everything together? And then in terms of listening, um, one of the hacks that I kind of came up with, I guess. I'm sure it's not original. Um, but I watch a lot of shows on Netflix, as I'm sure a lot of you guys do. But I discovered um, that if you listen to a uh, TV show that's produced in another language, so for me, it's German, you can switch on um, not only the subtitles, which is helpful, but you can switch on something called audio described, which basically will 
describe to you. Um, it's intended for people who are um, unable to see um, to be able to hear what's happening in the show. But to somebody who's also, you know, not really very good at the language, hearing what's happening on the screen being described to me in German, you know, it'll be something like a man walks into the room. The man takes the keys from the table. Like I can see that. I can see what's happening and I can match up what's happening with what's being described. And this has been really, really helpful for me to learn listening. So yeah, basically what I would say is break down the problem figure out the goal, just take the parts that you need to do to achieve the goal, and then see how you can practice those skills repeatedly. That's, that's probably the best way of learning. All right, let's take another question from YouTube. Um, all right, we got one from... I think your name is Yuvraj Agarkar. So um, it's going to cut off the text again, but I'll read it out. I'm 17 and I've completed your iOS and web dev courses. My question is how to be good at reading docs and also how to start a startup. Okay, cool. So there's two, two questions in there. First question is how do you get good at reading docs? Um, the answer is, um, it depends. So firstly, there's a difference in the quality of documentation. So I worked a lot with iOS, and so I'm mostly reading Apple documentation, which is, I mean, it's beautiful. Like they've laid out the website really nicely. But if you've taken my iOS courses, you know that I think they're kind of minimalist. <laughs> they're kind of just like, oh yeah, we have this thing which you can use, um, but why don't you go and like find out yourself how to do it? So it, yeah, it's useful. But you know, if you've ever looked at some of Google's documentation, especially Flutter documentation, is absolutely incredible. And you know, really like kudos to the team because. It is the best documentation I've ever seen. It's kind of like, this is a method that we have in this particular module. This is how you would use it. Here's a code example. Here are the various um, parameters that you can you know, tweak. And it is just so good that you can sort of imagine yourself being able to pick up how to use it very easily. Whereas Apple kind of like, yeah, we don't really care. You know, if you make it, you make it. Um, if you make an app, there's enough people who make apps. I don't know. I don't know what is their, their thinking behind their documentation, but it's, it's very hard. Um, the second thing I would say is that you don't necessarily learn a lot from documentation. It's kind of like if you were learning a language and your starting point was the dictionary, you'll be there for a while. <laughs> so... The good thing is that, you know, this kind of comes back to how you learn, right? A lot of people still learn in a pre-computer, pre-internet kind of way, where you read a book, you, um, your lecturer gives you um, a lecture, you take notes, you memorize those notes, you read the book, you take more notes, you do a test. This, I would say, is good for exams or for school. It's probably still the way you have to do it. But if you're actually just trying to learn a skill for life or for you know changing jobs or just for yourself, it's not the best way because information is really cheap. Um, you can get hold of pretty much any knowledge or information you want just by typing it into Google. So why should I store all of that information in my brain when you know it's just two or three keystrokes away. So I don't really like to do that. And this comes back to documentation. I don't remember documentation. I don't learn documentation. There are loads of methods that I'm not, um, you know, I, I don't remember how to use. But the thing I know is that I have the skills to be able to understand the code when I need to. So when I want to look something up, I look it up in the documentation. Actually, usually I look it up in Stack Overflow. I try to see an example where it's used. And then in the example, I'll see a particular method that's in 
the documentation. And then if I want more background, I'll read up on it in the documentation. It's much better to learn things as and when you need to. So that's pretty much what I do. So the next question is um, how to start a startup. Um, that's like a really big question. Um, and I think back in the um, ask, there's also somebody who asked, um, I think it was somebody called Oliver, who said, what do you recommend to aspiring entrepreneurs? So I'm gonna answer these two together. Um, so when I started, um, so I kind of started building a startup while I was still working as a doctor, which is probably a little bit masochistic um, <laughs> because I was working these crazy hours. Like, oh man, it was probably like some 14 hour, occasionally like 16 hour days. And, um, but the good thing about medicine at least is you have night shifts or well, the good thing or the bad thing. And the night shifts, you know, to be humane, <laughs> at least in Europe, after three days of night shifts, we tend to get three days off. So the first day you'll be completely destroyed. You'll be hardly human because you're trying to switch time zones, right? It's kind of like flying to Australia and back every week. Um, so the first day is kind of like gone, but the second and third days, I found that um, I was able to kind of recuperate those days and I would just go to the library and I would work on my startup. So the first thing is you got to find time. Um, there is no perfect time to start a startup. There is no perfect opportunity that's just going to like hit you on the head. Everything that we've built, everything, every opportunity that's come to us has taken a lot of work to prepare to get to that point, right? Um, I think there was this, this thing that my granddad drilled into me, which is um, my late granddad. Um, he, he used to take me to school on his bicycle every day. And um, on this little like 30 minute bicycle ride, he would give me these like um chicken soup style like pieces of like nuggets of advice i have like so many pieces of advice including like okay they're gonna sound weird it's like if you ate um beans uncooked twice and you still continue eating uncooked beans then that's not very smart um, so I, I think what he's trying to say is don't make the same mistake twice. I don't know why it has to do with uncooked beans. Um, but another thing that he told me is that, you know, opportunities come to those who are prepared. I'm pretty sure it was another food analogy because I do really well with food analogies. That's the way I understand the world. Um, but he says that, you know, Every time you see somebody looking like as if they were just an overnight success, it's never overnight. You don't see all the hours and days that they've poured into doing something fruitful or not, successful or not, until they get to the point where they're prepared enough to be hit by that opportunity. So a good example, I think, is, um, for example, we built the Flutter course because um, uh, Tim, who heads up the Flutter team at Google, took my iOS course and he loved it so much that he reached out to me over Twitter. And this is how we partnered with the Flutter team at Google to build this course together. Now, if I had just started building courses day one and you know firstly nobody would know about you secondly you know there's no track record and thirdly i'm not even sure i would be able to build such a good um course from scratch so you know the idea is to spend all of your time preparing your startup working on it and then you know there will be moments there will be wins and there will be losses and you have to grab onto the wins and not think too much about the losses that's pretty much in a nutshell how i think about our startup 
Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the chat and I'm gonna ask you guys for some more questions. And let's see if we got some good ones. All right, so I think when I was looking at the questions um, that people had asked previously and also in YouTube right now, the one that I'm seeing a lot is this one. <laughs> it seems like everybody wants to know when the iOS 14 update is coming for iOS or is there going to be a new course? When is it going to happen? What is happening on that? Should I wait for the course? Should I continue the iOS 13 course? What's happening? Okay, so here's um, what is happening. Um, we've reviewed um, Big Sur and also the latest version of Xcode. We're in the process of testing the course through all of these new pieces of software. And what we realized is that the changes are not that great. Um, so there's basically not enough changes um, to there's a, they've tweaked the style of Xcode a little bit and they've added some handy features, which we might point out. But essentially over, you know, what we've been doing is we've, we've been just sort of trying to figure out how we can update the last parts of the course because they're more outdated. Whereas the beginning modules sort of up to flash chat, I think. So the first 14 or 15 modules, we're gonna keep as is because they still work but we'll update some of the interfaces. So at least initially it won't be so confusing. But that means that there will be no new iOS course. You won't have to buy anything. All the updates that we're making um, through this winter and next spring will get added to the existing iOS course. So don't buy any more courses, just keep the one that you already have and you'll see the updates roll in. But if you're already learning with the course, don't worry, the changes are not that big. Um, you'll, be able to, you'll be able to figure it out. So that's, that's what's happening on that. And let's see what other questions we've got in YouTube. All right, so we've got a question from Atharva Vasakar. And also some people on YouTube, it seems. Um, do you watch anime? Okay, so that's kind of, um, it's interesting that's, that's a question that um, everybody wants to know. I wonder if it's because of all the memes I put into the courses from anime. So I, I, I don't think that, um, I, so the anime that I like basically is quite old school, you know, your girl's not young. <laughs> and um, so for example, Ghibli movies, um, Spirit of the Way, it's like one of my favorite all time movies. It, I love it so much, um, but pretty much any Ghibli movie, it's, it's amazing. It's just like paints the scene. But more recently, I'm kind of late to the bandwagon here, but um, Netflix started showing this um, sort of a Western anime called Avatar The Last Airbender. Okay, so if you haven't watched this, um, don't be uh, put off by the name. It has a horrible name, but it is so good. It It's like reliving childhood you know like if you could just go back to being a little child that's how it feels it's so wholesome and oh my god it's just so good um if you haven't watched it i wouldn't ruin it for you but it is literally the best animated show i have ever watched and it has a special place in my heart um okay what other questions have we got We've got a question from a 13 year old boy. Um, I think Avadhut, Avadhut, Avadhut. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, and he asked, what careers can I have at age 13? Okay, so the full question I will read out because it's a little bit long. Um, he says that I'm a 13 year old boy 
I'm doing your web development course. I'm even doing a course based on how to create AI and ethical hacking. What careers can I have at this age or a job that doesn't consider my age? Please take this question. Love the way you teach. Found it easy to understand. Avid hoot. Okay. So firstly, why are you thinking about work? You're 13, man. Like, just enjoy life. It's so good to be that age. Um, but you know, then again, I, I have to say, like, when I was when I was 13, I was probably the same as you. I was also thinking about um like how to get a job. I don't know what it is. I think you're probably an overachiever, like a type A person like me as well. So when I was 13, I was thinking that um, I'd really like to have some pocket money because my parents didn't really believe in pocket money. And there were like sweets and snacks that my friends were having and I was kind of jealous. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to make my own money. So <laughs> I decided to take an inventory of what am I good at? And I tried out a couple of things. One is I got legs, I can walk. So I signed up for this thing in the UK. I'm not even sure what it's called in elsewhere, but basically there's um this giant book, like a telephone directory that we used to have like pre-internet days. It's called like the yellow pages in the UK. And you can basically go door to door lugging these like two kilogram books um, and you get paid a pound. So like about $1.20 for every one of these books that you deliver. So the thing is that they're so heavy. They're like, I don't know, they're, they're like two kilos each. So if you imagine 10 of them, and I was 13, um, that was pretty hard and I got some pocket money, but I thought about iterating on that. So, you know, coming back to startups, you gotta try something, you test it out, see if it works, see if people like it, um, see if it, gets you to your goal and if not you iterate so my iteration um basically ended up in me thinking about what else do I have and maybe like manual labor isn't really my strong point <laughs> so I thought that well you know I'm like pretty good at maths I'm pretty good at physics and um there's probably other kids who want to learn math and physics so I printed out these little flyers like from my little home printer. So like they were like this big each per ad because I didn't want to waste too much ink. And I cut it out of the page and um, it's about like eight ads per page. And I went door to door around sort of my neighborhood area, like an area that I thought was like within walking distance. And I posted it to everybody in the mailbox. Um, and then like some people actually called me up and then I became a tutor, although probably illegally because I'm pretty sure you're not allowed to work and earn money at age 13 unless you're like supervised or something. But that was like my first entrepreneurial um, bent. So coming back to your question, what careers can you have at age 13? Well, now that you have the internet, effectively you could do anything. You could like probably sign up on Fiverr and start doing freelance gigs. Um, I think when people sign up to these freelance gigs, they always want to like charge what it's worth. And I would say just don't do that. Don't, don't like go overboard. Charge way, way below what you think it should cost. So you want to build somebody a website, charge $5 for it, you know? And what you want to do is like build up your reputation. So as you get more clients and if they like what you do, hopefully you're doing a good job because, you know, you're my student, right? So you're going to be pretty good. And when you give the project back to them, you're learning like skills like communication, how to work with clients, what clients mean when they're saying like, oh, I would like that to look more classy. What does that actually mean to a web developer? Well, you're going to work that out. So once you've got a good client, then you've got a word of mouth. You've also got reviews. You've got a client who can be your referee and you build up on that. So you take on more clients. Maybe you've got too much work. So now you raise your, you, you raise your price. It's now $10. And then you've got like too much work again. You raise your price to $20. And that way, eventually you'll get to the point where you're making enough pocket money to buy sweets or whatever it is you know, um, you want to achieve, maybe you want to like 
buy stocks at age 13. Maybe you're gonna buy into Tesla. I don't know. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that's that's my advice. Um, let's see if we got some more questions on um YouTube. So let's see what you guys are saying in here. Oh, this is a really good one. So this is a question from um, Dionysius. Dionysius. I think that's how you pronounce it. <laughs> and he asked, understanding syntax is not so difficult. Formulating syntax together with logic to build functional code is difficult. What are the best strategies to connect the dots to build real world projects? This is something that you guys have voted a lot and it's something that we think is really important because one of the sort of feedback that we were always getting from students is, yeah, okay, so like, you know, I've completed this tutorial, I've completed that tutorial, but, you know, after I'm done, I still don't know how to make my project. I still don't know like how to, how to build something, right? So this was really like our thinking when we started building the 100 Days of Code project. I wanted to um, make a course basically which starts out with tutorials and a lot of heavy sort of um, guidance, but then to progress on to be able to let you experience what it's like when you know the training wheels are off. So when I first learned how to ride a bicycle, you know, I was riding it and I didn't really have one of those fancy bicycles with the training wheels. I just had my dad like holding the bicycle from behind. And, you know, initially I was just riding, he was running behind. And then at some point he kind of let go and I didn't really notice. And I could just start cycling myself. But then when I turned around and I saw that there was nobody there, I immediately crashed, right? So, um, yeah, I guess my, my track record with bicycles is not great. But um, so the, I guess the, the learning point there is that, you know, you can't always be in tutorial land if you want to become somebody who's not dependent on tutorials. So a lot of people have been asking me, hey, you know, this course, um, 100 Days of Code, why is it that there's like less and less video towards the end? Um, is it because you haven't finished it? What's happening? So the answer to that is no, it's not because I haven't finished it. It's because it's really carefully thought out, <gasps> believe it or not. And the idea is to be that person holding the bicycle from behind and then to eventually let you go because I want you to be able to finish that course and to get a job or to build your own startup, build your own project. But that requires quite a bit of struggle. And the struggle comes from building projects, right? But you know, when I say to people, the best way to learn to code after you finish a tutorial is to build a project. Well, they say, I don't know, which project do I build? And how do I build it? I don't know how to get there. So that's why we built this course to try and make it so that initially you have sort of more step-by-step -step, um, like video lessons and then you have step-by-step -step text lessons with more dependence on the documentation and on like the kind of real tools that a developer would use like Google and Stack Overflow. Like you need to struggle, you need to find out the answers for yourself. But, you know, there's walkthroughs and there's guidance. And then eventually to get you to the very end where you're actually building your own projects for your own portfolio, which contains 100% your own code, which you can, you know, copyright, you can sell, you can do whatever you want because it's your own. And what we've done is just provided the project ideas for you, something that we think is really feasible that you can definitely do if you've completed the entire first 80 days. So that was what we tried to do. And, you know, I think the best way to build real world projects is to start small. So don't start off trying to build a car, build a skateboard instead. 
And then once you've built the skateboard, maybe add a handle to it, turn it into a scooter. And then maybe once you've done that, turn it into a motorcycle and then turn it into a car. Don't just go out there and be like, I want to build Facebook plus Twitter plus, you know, whatever enterprise software. And I'm going to do it like after I complete this course, like that's just, you're setting yourself up to fail. You have to start with something simple. All right. So we're kind of running a bit over. I said we do 45 minutes, but we're kind of close to an hour now. So I'm just going to glance at the YouTube chat and try to see what you guys are saying like live. Um, let's do some quick questions. Swift UI or UI kit? Um, Swift UI is getting a lot better, but you know, when we did the Swift, uh, the Objective C to Swift conversion, it took like years still, like loads of apps are built with Objective C. So Swift UI is not something that you can learn and get hired for right now. It's really fun and I really enjoy playing with it, but I don't really think it's serious enough, like for my needs at the moment. So we're probably gonna build in more tutorials to the existing course. So if you miss that, you don't have to buy a new course. Your existing iOS 13 course will get updated, um, but it's gonna be probably more Swift UI, a little bit less UI kit, and then we're gonna keep tweaking that um, percentage until, you know, until like when Apple fully transitions. But I wanna do it slowly because right now, the, the kind of skills that's really important that's gonna get you hired is UI kit. Um, can you make your iOS course like 100 days challenge code? Um, I think when we thought about making the 100 days of code challenge, we thought about like, what's the perfect language for it? Because Python is something that you can do like a lot of different things with, like web development or data science um, or scripting or automation. Swift is pretty much all about making apps. And it just doesn't really work that well with it. Um, I think it works better when you can actually build real projects, like big projects that you can show off and you can use. I think it's just a better format. Like none of the things that we do is random. Like we, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about it. Um, okay, what kind of games do you prefer? Computer slash Android? Um, oh man, um, I recently got into this Steam game called um, Salt and Sanctuary. It's a two player couch co op. It's just so good. It's like, it's got like the RPG element, it's got um, platforming, it's got some combat, and it's got like just a lot of elements. It's like really well rounded. And I discovered that it was actually made by like one guy, essentially. He built the entire video game which is crazy, it's a really good one. And on Android, on phone, um, yeah, Among Us. <laughs> it's a bit of a gu guilty pleasure. If you haven't played it, don't, don't start. <laughs> um, okay, so what else are we seeing in the chat? Will you intend to build a Java course? Um, probably not. Um, I don't really like Java that much. Um, I feel like Oracle's gonna like send me a lawsuit just for saying the word Java. So um, the funny story is that we, we obviously have like an Android course and the Android course is built with Java. So we thought it'd be a good idea to put the Java logo on the course image. And then we got this like really serious letter from Oracle um, saying, um, yeah, you gotta take off our logo cause you don't own the logo for Java. And we were like, hey man, we're trying to teach your technology to people. Like we're trying to teach more people Java, which you own. But they were like, nope. So um, yeah, I think they're a bit, they're a bit old on that front. Uh, let's see what other messages have you guys got. Um, I'm completing the 100 days of code course with my grandfather. Wow, that's amazing. I've heard of people completing it with um, like their kids, like their 10 year old, 11 year old kids, but that's pretty awesome. You know, this is another good point. My friend was recently telling me the story that um, they, so he works at a bank and he was saying how they have this guy who is like the godfather of like their platform's code and nobody else can 
like fix it other than him and um i was like really curious you know and um so one day the like grandmaster of the finance company's code comes in and he's got like a walking stick he's like 69 or something and he's like really old he's got like white hairs and it turns out that their entire system is um built on pretty much like you know like really really old tech right and this is like the only guy who really understands how to do it these kind of old programming languages like COBOL um, or Fortran you know because there's not actually a lot of people who know it and it's super hard like when you if you tried learning C and you think that's hard like try learning Fortran it's it's even harder well, I guess there's also machine code but you know there's also a, a a point to be made that maybe somebody should teach like these old languages because there's obviously some future in it as well like all of the airline industry banking they're all built on COBOL which is crazy um what are the best books that you've read this year um the best books oh um there's a really good book on negotiation by Chris Voss and he's like this ex FBI negotiator. So like negotiating hostage releases and everything. And he wrote this book called, um, oh man, what's it called? Something about like, um, uh, never split the difference. That's it. So he basically just teaches you like how to negotiate. Like if you want to buy a used car, how to get the best deal, but using all of these skills that he got from like the FBI, which is, absolutely insane it was a really good book um okay so what else have we got uh java c plus plus or python which is the most powerful i mean what are you what are you trying to like you're trying to like street fighters <laughs> you know how on youtube there's all these like videos of like bear versus cobra <laughs> i think somebody should make a youtube video where it's like java programmer versus python programmer <laughs> I don't know. I don't think any of them are more powerful. I think they have their own uses. It's like kind of saying, you know, hammer versus saw, who's going to win? <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't really make too much sense. Um, what have we got? Uh, web development or software development, which one do you prefer? Ooh, that's a really hard one. I like... I like both actually. I don't know. I, I don't have a strong feeling towards it. I mean, okay, so here's a bit of a a secret. I, I don't really like JavaScript that much. Um, I think if you're somebody who's played with a lot of the newer languages that have been like developed recently, rather than a language that's old, that's just had new things bolted on, like JavaScript, you realize like how nice it is. Like Swift is lovely. Kotlin is nice. Dart, like they're all really nice languages. Python, but um, JavaScript, no. But web development you can do with Python, with JavaScript. It's really your choice these days with so many frameworks. Um, what else have we got? Uh, can you say something about UI UX designing? Uh, UI UX designing, um, it's really important. <laughs> oh, um, this is a good tip. Don't think about UI and UX at the end. Um, a friend of mine is a UX designer and she's really, really good. But like she says, always what happens is like companies will bring her in at the very end. They're like, oh, just sprinkle your like UX magic dust. And it's like, no, that doesn't work. You have to start from the very beginning. So super important um like read more about it try out loads of apps i know that these days people kind of like just have seven apps on their phone and they don't really add any other ones but um try out apps try out their user experience and then just make a note of the ones you really like like recently um in the uk there's a bank um startup called monzo and when you get their bank card in the mail when you're setting it up, so when you're doing that with like a normal bank, like you know HSBC or whatever, you have to like call up their customer service, you have to go into the branch, they type some stuff, you fill in some forms. This Monzo card came in, I had to download the Monzo app, 
and then it was literally like using NFC, touch your phone, and then it was like, it's all set up. That was amazing. That is good UX. That is some fantastic US. Um, last question I'm gonna take, I'm gonna pick the last question before we take off. Let's see. Um, what's the last question? Oh, this is so hard. Uh, la la. Duh. Okay, I'm gonna pick you because I see you in the Q and A doing hundred days of Python all the time, Mattia. You're like really, really strong on the motivation. So your question is, how do you make prices for software like how do you price software i think is what you mean um i mean theoretically what people say is price your software at the price that people are willing to pay for it but i mean i'm not really the right person to ask um because i don't really like doing marketing i don't really like doing sales i just don't like when i make my courses i kind of think if it's something that people want, then they'll get it. Like, I don't want to like, I don't want to like tell people to buy something that they don't need or they don't want, you know? Um, like, I think the marketing team wanted me to do this AMA so that we could promote the new 100 Days of Python course, but they're gonna hate me because I haven't done any of that and I'm not planning to. Um, yeah, I mean, check it out, it's in the description below. Um, if you want to get the 100 days of Python course, um, you can get it for whatever price is there. But, um, you know, I think you should price your product um, depending on its appeal. So if it's something that has mass appeal, then, you know, you can afford to make it a bit cheaper. If it's something that has only very few people interested in it, like, for example, if tomorrow I wanted to build a software for people who are live streaming on YouTube so that they can play music as a DJ. Like, I don't know how many people are interested in it. Maybe a lot, actually, I don't know. Um, but if it's something that's really niche, then you've got to price it more because, you know, considering the amount of time that it takes to develop. But um, I mean, a good example is that um, our team, um, you know, thought really hard about how we price our courses and one of the things that we thought about is that you know if we can afford to make it cheaper then we will because yes people will buy it for two hundred dollars and yes you know six people worked on this project for almost two years and they you know they should bring out a product that's worth a lot but at the same time you know like a lot of people around the world have very different um, living conditions. I know that um, I lived in Malawi for a while um, in Africa and, you know, I know like in villages and, you know, people don't have a lot. Um, so what you might think is a lot is, what you might think is a little is actually a lot to some other people. So we really wanted to be able to make courses that anybody can afford. Um, so. I, I would just say, you know, really depends, depends on you. Um, so I think this is going to be the last question, unless there's something fun in here. Can I work at App Brewery someday? Um, well, I mean, there's COVID, um, but there's also like remote positions. Um, we're thinking of maybe hiring some interns at some point, um, but I don't really know how it'll work. Maybe we'll announce it as like an educational announcement. I don't know, but we'll think about that. All right, so it's now way, way past time and my tummy's kind of rumbling. You know how it is. Um, the girl is hungry. Um, so I'm gonna probably sign off. And um, so thanks you guys, all 1000 of you guys, or more who joined in for the live stream today. And I hope you will um, carry on coding and I hope you all the success in the world from your instructor, Angela. 
Good night. Good morning, wherever you are. Bye.